if you take and lose that that um, the, the straw colored zone and you put that green in what's sort of acting like a like a pointy corner, what are you going to expect to happen? The green. You're going to intensify that green. And if it starts blending with the red, what do you get? Okay, you see how it kind of gets? So that advice would be spot on. You want that little bit of yellow, that straw yellow, to moderate the green. Visually, it makes the green more obvious to our eyes. And sense in the market, the collectors want green as premium. It may not be my personal preference, but that's what the market wants. So if he can preserve that green, even with the red, you and I might say, yeah. There's people out there who pay more for that. Yep. So that, and that's the bottom line from our purposes. That was kind of going to be my next question. Um, you know, beauty's in the eye of the beholder, of course. Right. But from a, a value perspective, generally speaking, in the marketplace, was he better to do this, or would he have been better to cut it smaller and only capture the red? Okay. So the question is, is it better to go towards like what he suggested, a redder stone, or to keep this blended? Or maybe you saw a third thing, and there could be other possibilities. The answer is, depends on your customers. Or if you're cutting for yourself, depends on you. One of the things I chopped off this talk, and you just cornered me into it, because it was getting too long, uh, was who cares? Who cares, all right? And I'm not just being flippant. If you're cutting for yourself, the answer to that question is I care. So you might have this particular sunstone and say, you know what, I don't like green. I suggest you don't buy it because you pay extra for those, but if you had it, you might, you might cut it down the red and get rid of the green. If I'm trying to sell into the Western, Western US sunstone market, I'm going to keep that green because my customer cares. I'm on the East Coast, okay? I'm not going to buy a stone at all. I have to explain to people what sunstone is. I mean, Jules, look at that, yeah, what's that? what is that? Okay, so the answer becomes entirely who cares? Is it you, is it your customer, uh, the person you're giving a gift to? What, whatever your answer is, that's how you answer that question. Um, there's no one piece to that one. I feel like for last night. <laughs> He's right, that's all there is to it. Okay, back to work. So, uh, Fabian, right. Nemtrine, technically quartz is dichroic, but it's so subtle you never see it. So we're dealing with color zones, right? Yeah. All right. So just looking at this picture, you've got, and I'm going to make it move in a second. You've got purple and yellow, but what colors do you actually see? Why? This is Blending the with the brilliant things. pavilion. Yeah, it's, it's a radiant cut, but it's moving towards that brilliance end of things. Okay, exactly right. Now, one other detail, some of you might notice, you might not. I had to see the video to get it. Watch where the purple is when you tilt it to the side. Go on. What's the purple do? What's that? Yeah, it goes, it's a keel that has sort of a hit to the coolant. What's the purple do? Over 60%, just past the coolant. So what do you get face up? Primarily purple. You have a brilliant type stone. It's blending. Well, it's, it's not quite brilliant. It's moving that way. It's blending. So you don't get the stink yellow, dominant purple. See how it works? If you wish to do a harder division, okay, you want to see purple yellow, what would you have to do with the stone before you cut it, obviously? What would you have to do? Well, I think somebody said step cut, the mask got in my way. That's exactly right. Your only choice is step cut, because that keeps them from blending. And if you wanted a harder blend, you know, you would move more towards the, the brilliant in the step. Mm -hmm. And Australian sapphire. Mm, wow. Now, this one flipped my thinking. Uh, buddy Jamie Irvin, he's an Australian cutter. Uh, you'd only know him if you happen to be on Facebook in the same groups of stuff. He works down in Australia. Uh, he pretty much does only sapphires. If you're familiar with this material, uh, it's similar to Nigeria. There's a deposit sort of in China. They don't work anymore. Um, there's uh, Kenyan material like this in Australia where it's really dark. You have super strong color zones, typically blended with a, a yellow. I think it's a basalt sapphire or something. It's more Jamal than you guys. Um, so, 
our question here in the US in general is how do we intensify color? How do we take like that Sri Lankan stone and make it stronger? His challenge in Australia is, okay, how do I make this thing lighter? Because their stuff is so dark, if you just cut it, you're gonna get a black sapphire. You can see a lot of it. It turns out they use exactly the same techniques I just explained to you in the opposite direction. And this, I, this is such a wonderful thought. So this is a very dark sapphire that he was able to get to go lighter. And I, I was tempted to break it into two slides so we could talk about it without the uh, diagram, but I don't want to torture you too much. If you look at this inside, he's using a blending technique. He's got kind of a cone thing going on. You see the yellow in the corners? And the dark in the opposite corners? Those corners are concentrating a bit, which is a design effect here, but it gives us a hint of what, he, what the cutter's doing. He diagrammed it for me. He said, what we do is we take the darkest color zone and we put it in that bottom pavilion cone and try to tilt it off as much as we can they tend to be wide color zones. You don't have a lot to, to mess with here in terms of play. Okay, I'm thinking that's darkening. But then he said, I try to get the best yellow over top of it. Remember when we put color in the crown? You end up blending. We're in a scenario where we are stuck with large dark color zones, so you can't get away from them. So I'm gonna leverage, he's gonna leverage that blending effect of putting that color high, lighter color higher in the crown forcing it to blend. So where you get upper right corner, if you didn't cut it right, you get that dark. He's forcing the yellow to blend in. You get this lovely kind of light blue. It's heading towards a blue green. And you lighten the overall effect of the stone. Exactly the opposite of what I would have thought. I would have tried to put the yellow in the bottom, and that would have forced the really dark zone to blend into it. And it would have the opposite, because the yellow is too weak. Um, there you go. It, it's all about controlling color. Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't have believed this, except A, Jamie told me he does these all the time. And then Fabian said, yeah, let me show you. Or Red said, yeah, let me show you. There it is, color's on the top, and you're blending. See how you were stuck with that darker blue? But at least we can, we can, we can light it up. This one was new for me, too. I, I didn't realize you could do this. Okay, I got one more section, but I'm at, at an hour. You want a little more technical stuff, or you want to jump out here? What do you guys want? Oh, yeah, okay. yeah, go for it. There you go. You want to. So, dichroic stones. Let's go back to tourmaline for a minute. Um, one of the questions I've always had, but I haven't had the rough time or ambition to test it out, because you need like six or seven pieces of the same matched rough to do this. But Reg was able to help me because he could model it. What I want to know is we have an ugly dark C axis terminate, all right? And you've got a beautiful face up color like that indicolet I showed you. There are only so many cuts you can do that. You can do with it right now. You can do, you know, your standard terminate cut. You can do maybe a little bit of radiant stuff going. That's going to be it. What, what do we do with these longer crystals? So it's like, okay, how far can I go in on that long side, going from center line, the 96, we'll use a 96 gear for this example. 96, uh, can I go plus minus one? You know, just offset a little bit, two, three, four, five, six. How far out can I go before I start getting that ugly axis in? To do this for real, I would have to cut, like I said, all six of those and figure it out. I know by six, we're getting that ugly, that ugly axis in. But where is it between? One or two off and six. So here's my diagram. So we're all on the same page. Super simple baguette. I just threw this together quick. The crown's not going to change at all, and neither are the very ends. There's, like I said, those are about 70 or something like that. All the change is going to happen on the just the pavilion. So my two wing facets that are coming together, kind of in a key line, cool it. Plus minus one. I'm keeping it at 42 degrees for the, all the rest of this. The only thing we're changing are the indexes. How how broad those facets are, okay. and the barium just to make to keep it rectangular, but that's not going to influence. So, here's the current state of the software. Um, it, the, the one way I can show you right here on my computer. Uh, this is the step through, plus or minus one. You know, just a little bit off the center. Two, three, four, five, down to six. 
And, you know, it's in the current modeling software, it looks, I, I kind of like six, to be honest with you. In fact, in fact, this is the part answer to your question. Keep thinking of this as we go. You might be able to use that plus or minus six in the stone you were talking about. Because, just hold that thought in mind. This is current software. Current software does not account for an ugly C axis. This is just how it would look face up if you were doing it like in glass, something consistent color. Turn with that glass. Talk to Reg about it, he goes, I can do that for you. And so what he did is he decided, uh, he had to experiment. This guy, went, one of the reasons I'm advertising for him is he went way out of his way to figure this out. He went a step beyond. He didn't do the colors I gave him. He said, no, Peter, this works, your experiment works better if you use a black background, a colorless center, than a green C axis, because you can see the change happen. He says, okay, thanks, fantastic. Let's make this faster and not torture you. On the left, which is plus minus one, so plus minus two, we're going there. Plus minus one, you basically have no, you have to wait for the front view. You've got no green influence. The center is colorless, so no green influence. On two, it's pretty much the same, except watch when it tilts. Peter, what? what Sorry, what are you changing with the plus and minus two? Only the index gear. I'm going from center line being zero, plus minus one on either side is the first one. Okay, then I'm changing plus minus two. So the uh, first one would be uh, 95, one, and then going to 94, two. And that's only that three. bottom pavilion facet only, to the cube. Only that facet, nothing else is changing. So we want to see when does that C axis come in. Okay, so the plus minus two looks pretty safe. So here's three and four, and for those of you who are close enough to can see, I've got the index numbers in the bottom, if, if that helps you out. And later on, you can look at it closer if this is too far. But before anything moves, at three, you start seeing that green. It's not much, but it's there. So if we had something ugly, like black, and you had that beautiful indicolite face up, we're starting to lose that electric color. Just barely, but we're starting to lose it. Four, it's obvious. So here's three moving. And actually, I like the reflections. I mean, that's fine. But we don't want to see any green face up in this example. And four moving. And by this point, four, it's pretty obvious. We got, we got a lot of influence there. If you have a delicate color face up, it will be strongly influenced by the alternate. So I know five and six, I, I, you know what's going to happen here. Um, so you get that 591, and we'll look at that. If you had a delicate color face up, you'd be heading towards a grace. And <coughs> just, just to finish the experiment, you know, there's six. And that is basically you were seeing your C axis color face up. You have, like in my, uh, my peach purple one, you see how you've got that? That right there. Well, it'll be a bow tie, except it's a, it's a colorless. All right? So now we know um, the amount of range you have to play with in a rectangular stone, you can go three index gears off the center line, and you're, you're, you're pretty safe. So you can get creative in that space. As soon as you go four index gears off the center line, you're starting to get into whatever that other color is. You might be able to use it to great effect, like, like the gentleman with the hot pink versus light pink. Or if you have something dark that you don't want influencing, you want to stay conservative. I hope it's useful. I, I was so happy to be able to do this. And one last commercial. For those of you who want to get really technical, um, the new software has a color brightness setting. The old one does not account for density of color. So what he did here is he showed me the example of the ones we showed. Um, you know that if you cut a design that looks good on GemCut or uh, GemCut Studio, if it, the garnet turns out to be a little bit darker than you expected, the design doesn't work as well. This can account for that. You can make it a little bit darker and see how it goes. This is pure commercial stuff in terms of promoting the software. Um, so so great what he showed me. And just because it's cool, this is a marble that I use for demonstrations for clubs and things just to show people about light control. 
now that we've been through all of this, what are we looking at? You're looking at a brilliant type design, okay? We've got a color zone in the center that goes past 60%. In this case, it's that wonderful swirl of uh, glass. And so what do you get? You get blending all around the edges. In this case, it's reflecting all those colors. That's how you control it, guys. And that's it, that's all I got. Any questions? Thank you. She didn't fall over. <laughs> I told her she felt if she falls over, I'm done. That's how I know it's too much. Um, so if there's any questions or you want to see something on the clearer screen, you're more than welcome. Yes, sir. So, so that, that first one, uh, the tricrog, first question is, was that the crystal shape that you were showing us, kind of a flat cube? Uh, the, um, the, uh, the Andalusite? Or the uh, imitation yeah. one that, on the software. No, no, the first, very, the very beginning, the trichroic was like a flat cube. Okay, the end of yes. Was that the crystal just yeah. natural? Okay, yeah. you, you cut that? Yeah, oh yeah. Okay. Uh, those, you know, it's really hard to get natural crystals of end of this. I don't think I've seen one. Okay. Uh, I pulled this out of a pile of, um, actually, Farouk's rub. He was here last night. He just had a bag of it, and I just pulled one that was kind of uh, thick tabby that I could make this example from. Ideally, I wanted like a perfect cube, but it just it wasn't there. So, so is there a is there a cut? And I, I don't know near enough about the, the the play of light to think of like what it might be, but like a like a tall crown trillion, or something that would where you could really in the stone when somebody's wearing it experience all three colors. In Andalusia, you don't need that. Well, if I you can say you need it. Oh no no no! I'm just saying you don't you don't need that design. Oh. oh, yeah, I'm sorry, I wasn't clear. Because the Andalusite is so strongly trichroic, as long as you orient good color face up, you're probably going to see the other two. Unless you use a step cut, which is going to isolate things. So, like, as you turn it, then? Oh, yeah. Finger, you would see. Yeah, if you ever, um, if you happen to be at the shows, sometimes you can, it's a rare stone. You can find it around. It's not terribly expensive. And you'll see. It, it's, it's real distinctive. Um, with Tanzanite, it's a little bit different answer. Um, yes, sir. This, this is more of an observation rather than a question, but mm -hmm. something you may not be aware of. But if you take, if you take a piece of Tanzanite, mm -hmm. and without, I mean, you know, you were mentioning rotating the stone. Leave the stone in one orientation. Mm -hmm. If you take a piece of Polaroid, yep. polar, a polarizing filter, and put it in one direction, you'll get one color. That's if correct. you rotate it 90 degrees, you'll, get, you'll see the other color. You don't have to move the stone at all. That's exactly correct. And the other way that we, when I teach that, that technique, they tell people to rotate the stone. Um, and the reason I do that is typically it's easier than rotating the filter and people don't get exactly right 90 degrees. Um, that, what you just described is a way I've seen of um, sorting through large parcels. I know a Brazilian guy taught me that. We'll take a large parcel of like barrel or something and you spread it out on a light table and you hold that polarizer, he doesn't, and he does this and then 90 degrees. And well, it goes, I, 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 gotta, I, I don't even use a polarizer, I mean I have you can buy very inexpensive, uh, uh, just the film, polar, right. the polarizing yeah. film, and then just cut a piece of it and then rotate yeah. it 90 degrees. It's real easy to no, do. No, I've, I've got yeah. some in my bag. Yeah. And then that's what he does. It's, yeah. it's just a film, but it's, yeah. it's a polarizer. Yeah. Uh, anyway, and, but he goes over that, and the reason he does that is if they mix glass into the aqua parcels, the aqua all changes very little, but it changes on rotated polarizer, the glass doesn't. And that's a quick way they, they pull it out. You're, you're spot on. And uh, when we taught in, with Dan, we taught in Jamalaji Malawi, I took those, we took those large polarizers, cut them into squares, and you get two. And with two of, one is, you're spot on, but with two, you can make a polariscope yeah. by holding it together. And it was just a tool, and you yeah. can give them. They're so cheap. You can yeah. say, here, you can have one. That, that's absolutely correct. Yeah. Um, for our purposes as cutters, I don't recommend it. Reason being, people aren't going to look at it with polarizer. So I'm concerned not, that's great for identifying, is my material dye or trichroic? In terms of how I want to cut it, I need to know if it is, and then which color I would like face up. And you, that part, you know, you got to do by eye. But you're spot on. That's how it's done. Anybody else? Anything else? Yes, sir. So, if you, and I did, cut a um, chrome tourmaline 
that is dead black down the edges and a pretty hefty green, fairly dark green on the other axis. Yep. And you end up with a dead black stone. Yep. <laughs> if I if I cut it down this way, it, by the way, it's it's, it's a you know it's, it's that way. Worst case, it actually has a tip on both ends. Right. So if I square that up, square it back down this way, and go to something on the order of two or three mm -hmm. that you were saying at ninety. Uh, well, the ninety-six and ninety. Yeah. Well, yep. not all the way to. Yeah, say 95 or 93 mm -hmm. on the on the on the pavilion, just simple letter, square everything up. I might get some color out of it. You might. The problem with chrome turning. Right now, it's a waste of, of time and money. You know? Yeah, no, I, I I feel for you. I, I've cut my share of chrome as well. I did this years and years ago, and I didn't know any better. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm with you. <laughs> Um, chrome tourmaline is one of those stones where the color density is so high yeah. that even the light access is dark. Yeah. For those stones, man, it Never depends. Out of it, eh? Yeah, I. Yeah, Somebody I answered that yesterday. Yeah. The answer is Ooh. don't buy it. Yep, that's yeah, right. Trying to get around to that. I think Lisa Elser said it. Don't buy dark chrome tourmaline. Yeah. And then this is when I one of the reasons I only work for the trade. Um, one of the reasons. There's several is that occasionally you'll have somebody, usually from the public, say, hey, I've got this stone, they'll show me a picture. Can you make it really bright? And it's like black. We're talking that kind of garnet that you walk by. Oh, and often they're doing this. Look, it's beautiful, you know, up at the sun. I'm like, we can enhance, we can make sparkle, we can't change the color. Everything I talked about is about manipulating color, which is different from changing the color. Um, heating, some treatments, maybe, with garnet you're done. That tourmaline, forget about it, it's not going to happen. Other tourmalines, like yours, you could heat, don't touch it, but you could. Um, yeah, no, sorry, it's chrome tourmaline. You can try it, I've seen people window those and get better. Delib shoot for a deliberate window. I don't like it, but it does, it helps. Um, sorry. Yeah, <laughs> if it just came out somewhat green, it would be nice. But you know, black is ridiculous. Yep, that's... I, I keep asking the same question, and I keep getting the same answer, but I'm not going to stop. Okay, good. <laughs> uh, Me either. Of, of different people, but... Well, it's because there's, like, there's cool garnets here and, and in Arizona, and they're really dark, yep. they're super jelly, and, and I keep thinking there's got to be a really shallow cut, because just like that... We're talking about how they layered the garnet, and I'm thinking, well, maybe it's because the garnet was so dark, you put a tiny slice, and you get a lot of color, but it's got to be a little thin slice. That was maybe a misplaced connection, because they did that. One of the reasons they did that was to give the stone a harder surface, so it didn't appear like glass, because glass chips up easy. So they would put those, they put a thin wafer of garnet, almondine, because it's cheap, and there's two ways to identify them. Uh, if you were a gemologist searching for this stuff. Sideways, on, uh, in dark field lighting, you can see red and whatever, and oftentimes you can see the glue line. Um, that, that's, the glue line's the other way to do it. But they did that not for color, mainly for hardness. Yeah, okay. Okay, but it, the uh, example that I had where you put the color in the crown rather than the pavilion, it didn't matter how dark that was because it was super thin and the lighter color underneath it was going to blend it out. So it was just, it was a hardness thing they did to try to trick people into, so, but you just, know. But just straight garnet, you know, I mean, could you make a really flat? Yeah, they're, they're called rose cuts. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> no, and I'm not, that's yeah, not yeah, a joke no, at all. Yeah. It, or portraits. Yeah. Or, well, portraits, the, the current fad. But your uh, Bohemian garnets out of the late 1800s, where it was in the, one of the Czech rivers, they have a bunch of that, it's pyro, the really dark pyro. And they could get gathered by the handful. They found that if you make a, you're all familiar with what a rose cut is? Okay, okay, that's fine. A rose cut, if you take a, um, well, it comes from, it's an antique diamond, it, uh, diamond. If you take a cabochon, that's the easiest way to do it. Take a dome cabochon and fasten it. You basically have a rose cut. Okay, if you look them up, there's specific designs for them, classically speaking, but that's what it is a flat bottom, that's in a dome. Um, if you use that, and they did that with the Bohemian garnets, 
because they could get that luscious, deep red out of them. And they're very tiny stones, all rose cut. And basically, they're windows. And you have no pavilion to concentrate the red, right? And you're, you're spot on, and that's what they do. And I actually have, the, I actually have orders for them. Um, not the bohemian ones, that's hard to get, but just out of regular garnet, people like them. I've seen them take uh, really nice sapphire, the Australian stuff. And you, you look on Instagram sometimes, somebody will post me a 50 of them, and they'll sell, damn, disturbingly fast. Some days I wonder what I'm doing with the fancy stuff. It's like, okay. <laughs> that's that's what I, how would I would approach it, anyway. And you polish the bottom, right? I do. Others don't. Um, that's, but I would, because I won't. It looks unfinished. So you could do a double rose cut and yes. accomplish the same thing and have yep. a little more life, liveliness of the stone, right? You know, it's, it's, and this, this, this uh, jumps into aesthetics. You're 100% correct. A double rose cut is if you, it's a double dome cab with both sides are faceted, so it's like a flat, flattened sphere. Um, the thing with that is, to my eye, and this is strictly personal subjective, it starts looking like a badly cut stone. Whereas a rose cut with a flat polished bottom, okay, well that's meant to be a rose cut. <laughs> you, know, you will save a lot more weight doing that and some people prefer them. They did that with diamonds and things like 17th, 17th, 18th century. It, it was a big thing. Because with diamonds, high enough RI, it does add, it does add pop to it, no question. Garnets, not so much. All right. Well, Peter, thank you so much for your time. You're very uh, welcome. Great presentation. Thank you.